Welcome to Locked On Golden Knights. On today's show, more rumors about Barry Trotz perhaps coming. What went wrong in New York with Locked On Unders, very own Gil, BGK President George McPhee. Jack Eichel played with a broken thumb for the four weeks of the season. And VGK gets 15th pick overall in yesterday's NHL draft, which they send to the Sabres. More ahead after this. For Locked On Golden Knights, your daily podcast on the Vegas Golden Knights, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Board everyone. Hi again, everyone. I'm Tony Cardasco. You could follow us at Locked On VGK on YouTube as well as Twitter. I'm at Tony Dad Twitter. Our co host Chris Gallick can be D. Chris G on Twitter. And we've got a special guest. Our good friend Gil Martin joins us today, Locked Islander. And uh, we're going to discuss what could have led to firing with the Islanders and what could be ahead for Tremid all of these rumors perhaps that VGK could be making a run for trots during the offseason Gil it is so good to see you once again and uh, were you as surprised as the rest of the hockey world that Lulo do we know what led to the firing and was it something on the ice all, all that we read in Lamorello wanted a new voice in the locker room it was very much a surprise to me, uh, you know, wake up Monday morning and there it is in my uh, on my phone. <laughs> Did not expect it at all. You know, you think about what Trotz achieved in New York, three straight playoff seasons, two straight trips to the conference final. He's the third winningest coach in NHL history during the regular season, won a Stanley Cup. This season for the Islanders, it was sort of like a perfect storm of strange goings on. You're opening the season with a 13 game road trip. You come back home to a new arena, which your team is not familiar with. COVID hits the team. They're missing six, seven, eight players a game. They go through an 08 and three slump as a result. And then because of COVID on the back end, you have an older team with a lot of games to make up. So it, it, I, I, of all the factors that made the Islanders disappoint this year. Barry Trotz is very low down on that list of factors. I was surprised he was let go, although the more I think about it, Lou Lamorello, I remember when he was GM of the Devils, he fired Larry Robinson with about two or three games left in the regular season when his team was in first place. So Lou Lamorello doesn't uh, have a reputation for having a lot of patience and from what I've gathered from speaking to a number of people, the the departing interviews with the players probably was the big downfall for Barry Trotz, that there was a certain feeling in that locker room that he may have either lost the team or they were tired of playing his system. And as a result, he's been let go. Boy, does that, Can, that sound familiar? I was just thinking <laughs> that. Um, the boy here, same thing. Yeah, a couple things that stood out. One, you mentioned Barry Trotz as a Stanley Cup champion. I almost took you off the show for that, but that's okay. Um, what stood out to me, and we're going to hit this later, um, McPhee had a, a very good interview yesterday, and he hit very hard on how the exit interview process works. And you mentioned that possibly is was one of the high determining factors. Do you have any more details about what was possibly said, what was, this is a surprise, like you said, and obviously we're not privy to the locker room interviews and the exit interviews and all that. Any idea what was said that possibly led to that? You know, the, the system that Barry Trotz plays is a defense first system that requires a lot of, uh, 
a lot of exactitude. You've got to be in the right place exactly at the right time or it doesn't work. And I think over the course of an 82 game schedule, uh, after four seasons of doing that, it, it, it does mentally and physically wear out a team. The Islanders under Barry Trotz were a tough team to play against, but it's also tough on the players. And the one thing that the two seasons that the Islanders reached the conference final had in common is that they were not 82 game seasons. They were both COVID shortened seasons. Now, you know, at first I'm like, okay, uh, that might've been a big factor. But then I look back at his record in Nashville. He was there for more than a decade. Now those teams had lower expectations, especially at first they were an expansion team, but you know, there was probably a little more player turnover, but that organization played that system for 10, 12 years. So, uh, you know, did these players tire of it? Maybe. Uh, but does every player tire of it? Apparently not. So, yeah, I think here in Las Vegas, again, our guest is Gil Martin from Locked On Islanders, and we're talking about Barry Trotz. And here in Las Vegas, I feel that the players got tired of the Pete DeBoer system. He's a coach in limbo. I have to ask you, what if Gil from Trot's system differed from his days in Washington to the same system? Because a lot of the fans here in Las Vegas and VG team, admittedly, without an identity this past season, fans are asking if Trot could run a system that's known as a defensive coach if he were to come here to Las Vegas. Uh, what are the main tra uh, traits, I should say, of a trot system that the fans should know about? And is he is one of those coaches that can adapt? I think he can. I mean, you got to remember he won the Stanley Cup with Alex Ovechkin, and it wasn't like Ovechkin's stats went way down when uh, when he was playing under Barry Trot. So there does seem to be a certain amount of uh, flexibility there. Look, the Islanders, he played that defense first system predominantly because this is a team on Long Island right now that lacks explosive scorers. So in order to win, that's what he had to do. On Long Island, it was a defense first. You've got to back check. You've got to be positionally sound. And you really had to be in, an, in a very specific position on the ice to do that. So... Uh, it sacrificed offense for for back checking and for checking aggressively in order to create turnovers and then pounce on those turnovers for the most part because this team didn't have a lot of players who could create goals on their own based on their skill set. I, I got two for you. Um, one, specifically tell me what the Barclays experience was like being inside that arena not built in any fashion for hockey it seemed like and then also what kind of toll has the stadium situation taken starting with the Barclays Center and then bouncing between Nassau and then now at a USB and everything like what is UBS USB forget my apologies I, I had it right earlier um but What's what's that whole experience like, and can that somehow tie into the Trot situation as well? Well, I think Trotz did a very good job of keeping the team level uh, emotionally when all the difficulties with the arena were taking place. You know, moving from the Nassau Coliseum to Brooklyn. Brooklyn, look, it's a beautiful arena. It's great for concerts. It's great for basketball. It's not built for hockey. And you had the obstructed view seats, and it was all difficult. of them. How was that? All, all of the obstructed view seats. Yeah, you had a lot of obstructed <laughs> view seats, and it was difficult logistically for a lot of fans from Long Island to get to that arena easily. So, you know, those were some of the difficulties there. Then they split time, as you mentioned, between Brooklyn and the Nassau Coliseum, uh, and then only played at the Coliseum and then off to UBS. All throughout that, I think Trotz did a good job of keeping this team focused and and playing at a high level. The move to UBS, I think, you know, first of all, you start the season with 13 straight road games. That's t And none of them, I think one of them was in New Jersey, but all the rest of them were real West Coast or South wow. 
uh, trips. It wasn't like Philly, Washington, Boston, Madison Square Garden. They went to Western Canada. They went to Florida. They went to Colorado. So that was a real, you know, road trip for 13 games. And then when you start at the new arena, look, there's one thing about home ice advantage. You're more familiar with the boards. You're more familiar with the way the puck bounces, the quality of the ice, uh, and you're comfortable in your own arena. When you're in a new arena, that doesn't exist yet. It takes time. There's no shortcut for that. So, you know, and then, of course, after two or three home games, that's when the COVID uh, wave hit the team. So I don't blame Trotz for for the adjustment to the arena, and he did a good job of keeping this team level-headed throughout the previous moves. Yeah, and we did not hear the complaining that we're locally from Pete DeBoer and the brass. With he just was not a guy that made excuses or complained, right? Uh, and again, our guest is Gilman. You could find him on Twitter at Ice Wars NYR versus VS I. Ice Wars NYR VS NYI. And this trots in the future. Now, we've heard the rumors and the speculation that he wants to become perhaps a general manager. I think that, you know, if VGK really wants to get me talked about this yesterday, Chris and myself, I feel as though uh, the VA could come up with a package, maybe perhaps with an extension. He's making four million a year, an extension, sweeten the pot, maybe give him a raise there, if you will. And then perhaps a promise that he's the next general manager here. In Las Vegas, what do you think it might take? Yeah, that that might work. Uh, you know, you sign him to a four or five year contract with the promise of future general managership, or uh, maybe it's enough to give him a certain amount of input into uh, roster decisions or trades, or you know, that's language that can be worked out with his agent. Uh, but look, at this point, he is uh, one of the better hockey coaches out there. If you can get him sign them up. That would be my advice to you about Barry Trotz. So just a little more about Barry Trotz. I got some of his uh, stats down here and such. Obviously, he won the cup against us 17-18. Goes immediately, like like 48 hours later, he, he's out of town. 103 points with the Islanders. And then the two shortened seasons where runs to the, well, the conference finals, then the Stanley Cup semifinals with the goofy divisions and everything. And then all of a sudden he's out. So I just have to ask, is there, and we hit this a little bit earlier, of course, but is there just something beneath the surface about Barry Trotz where he's hard to play for? Does he not always have the team on his side? Like, let, let's just throw out this last season with all the challenges and everything. What was the buzz about him prior to this season? Was there underlying conditions that there was concerns was there something you could have looked at that was a hint that that led to this moment? The biggest concern I think that I had was that Trotz seemed to favor, and and so did Lou Lamorello. Although I don't know if that you know if the Lou Lamorello thing was trying to satisfy Trotz, they like to go with veteran players. And one thing he'll fit that, right in. He'll fit right in Vegas. There you go. <laughs> But, you know, Too many there were some younger contracts here. Yeah. There were Got some younger talented, contracts. <laughs> yeah. There were some younger talented players on the Islanders. Uh, Kiefer Bellows, a former number one pick. Oliver Wallstrom, who is a highly regarded offensive player on a team that was struggling for offense. And neither one of them really developed the way that fans were hoping they would under Trotz's leadership. He preferred to go with veterans. And I, I understand that because when you're playing a system that is requiring very exact positioning, you want to have guys who know that system, who you can rely on in that system, who will execute it consistently. And, you know, younger players, rookies, younger guys tend to make more mistakes and then the system breaks down. But a failure to develop some of those younger players adequately, I think, would have been the biggest knock on trots coming into this season but you can't argue with his success and i think before the season started islander fans were very comfortable saying 
we have got maybe the best coach general manager combination in the National Hockey League, and that's one of the reasons we've been successful. Yo, one final question. Who are some of the candidates to reap trots senators? Boy, you know, that's sort of wide open. Uh, Lane Lambert, who has been his assistant for several years, is one candidate. Uh, but realistically, it, it's uh, sort of a wide open field. I mean, Mike Babcock might be uh, a name. I've heard Pete DeBoer mentioned uh, as a possibility. A little swap, Paul maybe a swap. Yeah, right. <laughs> maybe a swap. I've heard Paul Maurice as a possibility. John Tortorella has been mentioned. Uh, Rick Tockett has been mentioned. So those are some of the more experienced names out there. But as of right now, I think it's pretty wide open. And once again, uh, we'd like to right thank now. you, Gil, for joining us. Yeah, Gil Martin is our guest. We thank you so much for being with us. Again, you could find him at Ice Wars NY versus NYI. Such a long Twitter name, but I love it. Yeah. And you're, you're the best, man. Great to catch up. Thanks for having me, guys. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Gil Martin has been our guest. And coming up next, George McFit, Jack Eichel played the final six weeks in with a broken hand. We'll get into that and else that McPhee spoke about on an out-of-town podcast. Go figure. You're listening to Locked On Golden Knights. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it is now impossible for your local chain auto parts to stock all of the parts that you need. Why endure the often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts at their computer, choosing only the brand that their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com, both at home and in your pocket. You could save time and money when you use Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more in parts from a chain store or a car dealership? One example, a Honda Odyssey fuel pump, $350 from a chain store. And Chris, it's $216 from Rock Auto. They have everything, everything that you need, from the brake parts to the tail lamps, the motor oil, and even new carpeting. Go explore their easy-to-read website today. You'll find a solution to your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now. You can see all the parts available for your car for your truck right locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you amazing selection reliably low prices all that your car will ever need rockauto.com once again rockauto.com welcome back to locked on golden knights thanks for making this your first listen and each and every day you can find us on every platform. Tony Cardasco, Chris Gallick from Las Vegas. And thanks again to Gil Martin for joining us from Locked On Islanders. George McPhee, okay, does not do local media interviews in Las Vegas because he does not, does not respect the media. He was on the Bob McCown cast on Monday, Chris, and he said Jack Eichel played the last six weeks of the season with a broken thumb. I went to the the game March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Eichel blocked the shot. Uh, Florida's McKenzie, and that happened in the second period. Got hurt, noticeably injured, holding hand as he went off the ice. Chris, we knew that this was a nag injury for Eichel. Remember, he couldn't even take face off for a while, and I felt that the injury was pretty bad at the time. Eichel really sucked it up, however, played down the stretch. Final 19 games with that injury with the broken thumb and it really did remind me of a season ago when Alec Martinez in the playoffs with the broken foot yeah Tony there's some amazing stories about what these uh warriors can do when they're injured and I just want to challenge everyone for a second to you know if you've had a broken finger or something like that before what it's like to go about your daily life simple things pouring coffee typing on the computer writing things down caring for your loved ones at your house all these little things that you i shouldn't say little things but all these things that you do okay now perform as a professional 
athlete where your thumbs are so important in what you're doing. One of them's broken. I mean, there's so much more to that. <clears throat> I have just a, a really bad example, but like an idiot, I got in a fight at an inline hockey game I played in back in Chicago. Hurt my thumb, still kind of messed up to this day, but I couldn't shoot a puck for, you know, three or four weeks. It was very uncomfortable, just taped it up a little bit, and now try doing that at an elite level, and it is just absolutely impossible. So I think everyone that's been dogging Eichel, and I think we've been pretty fair about Eichel, but at times we, we did dog him a little bit down the stretch, not too bad. But, you know, I think we all need to just take a step back and realize what he went through and how good he still was, Tony. I mean, he still had some very solid games. His stats tapered a little bit after the injury, but he was still a positive contributor on the ice, creating space, making plays. Unfortunately, we couldn't line him up with anyone to uh, finish. But, you know, he's a warrior. Alec Martinez is a warrior. Steve Eiserman played with a broken ankle. He's a warrior, you know, so hockey players are great, and it's amazing what these uh, what these uh, athletes can do. I thought we might uh, hear, I thought that we might hear something in the postseason about someone was injured, you know, and played injured, stretch with all those injuries, of course, uh, and we know Mark Stone came back. He wasn't ready. He has that back injury, and you could still tell that there were a lot of effects of that uh, back injury. You know, McPhee always speaks to the Canadian media, will not do anything here, and he should be held accountable. He should be doing end-of-season presser, right, like Kelly McCrimmon did. After all, he is the team president. And uh, once I heard him on a TSN interview, Chris, where he called Las Vegas down there. And down there, that means he's always up in Canada, like looking down on Las Vegas. And it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But McPhee also said that there was a strained relationship for just a moment. I'm reaching out there. Uh, just a moment between DeBoer, DeBoer and Robin Leonard. I thought that, that was pretty interesting because he just kind of dismissed it. He said he was concerned about it. And he said that uh, DeBoer was more or less concerned about Robin Leonard's injury. And there's just a lot of stuff floating out there in that front office. And it's just... It's a it's a comedy route. It really is a joke. It's it's a joke for the entire hockey world to see. The interview was very interesting. I was uh, speaking with a gentleman last night, um, so associated with the team. We'll leave it at that. And his claim was that McPhee is extremely calculated when he speaks. I, I get all the concern about the media he talks to and stuff like that. And and that's his choice. It, it, it is what it is. I know some of our local guys were not happy about the interview as, as such. And, and, and that's fair. I, I, I totally get that. But it was a very calculated interview. I thought it did give a little more insight to what happens. Um, uh, with Gil, we alluded to the exits interviews, the last interviews that the players have before they leave. And I, I thought it was interesting hearing McPhee's perspective. So season ends, uh, McCrimmon meets with each individual player. What went well, what didn't go well, where can we be better? Specifically, what is your relationship with the coach? I'm curious how that happens. Uh, McPhee, McCrimmon meet a couple of times. McPhee, McCrimmon, uh, DeBoer meet a couple of times. The next meeting that's gonna happen now is McCrimmon, McPhee, and Bill Foley. That's going to happen, I think uh, McPhee said, as soon as Thursday or Friday this week. I think that's when a plan is going to be determined about DeBoer and what path they're going to take with the head coach. If I had to handicap things, I know we just talked with Gil about the possibility of, um, of Trotz coming to Las Vegas, and I'm not against that by any means, but I get the feeling that McPhee, McCrimmon, DeBoer are all on the same page right now. I think that a plan is in place. I think they all bought into it. I think they all believe it. And McPhee, it, it was not an excuse. It was fact that we had, I believe, 513 man games missed. And McPhee truly believes that's why the team missed the playoffs. So you're not going to put that on DeBoer. He's not going to put that on DeBoer. Uh, you mentioned the relationship with Leonard. I thought that was a very 
slippery slope. And there's a lot more to that story than we're ever going to find out unless Robin decides to start tweeting sometime soon. Um, there is damage between DeBoer and Leonard. Not unrepairable damage. I mean, things happen in sports all the time. It's high pressure. It was a lost season, I guess you can call it at this point. So we heard about the lack of chemistry. We heard about some heated moments. It's all fair occurrences, giving VGK's recent success, four straight playoff runs, Stanley Cup contenders every single year, including this year. So I think the ship can get put back on tr on track. We can write the ship, so to speak. And I think the band all stays together. I don't think Trotz comes to Las Vegas. Um, I think they're going to give it another go with the retooled roster and see this plan uh, come hell or high water, so to speak. I felt that the ex interviews just based on the players' reactions in the final interview with the media, I just felt that it was damaging okay? because, again, and they just uh, repeatedly spoke about the system and how the system was not working. Well, that, again, directly relates to Peter DeBoer. And they also talked about the and being afraid to shoot the buzz. It's not allowable with then it's not permissible within that system. And to me, I think a lot of uh, these arrows are pointed and slanted towards Pete DeBoer. And I understand there were some great uh, comments there by Pete during that interview, uh, not finished with the analysis due to all those injuries. I get it. And then the thing that really stood out, uh, the fact that McPhee said it was an interesting comment about the fourth line, right? Towards the end of the interview, he said he felt that it was VGK's best line in the preseason. I love those guys. And he felt that they did a good job in the areas of puck possession, forechecking, playing physical, that they would have a terrific season. And then uh, he had Lissar and Carrier on that fourth line. And, and uh, the injuries on that line, he said that they did not, not play together because uh, not just injuries on that line, Curious. but they had to fill in on the first, second, and third lines, right, as well. Uh, they didn't play together until the 78th game of the season, and in that game, what happened? Kolasar went down. But that was a real interesting comment about the fourth line, and I'm sure it's something you'd like to address because you're gaga over line number four. <laughs> I do like that line four, and, you know, we did make the point that um, – it took a long time for that line to get together, and I felt that game against the Sharks for the first two periods, that was the game where it felt like the band was back together. Like It felt like things were actually getting back on track that game. They were rolling all four lines. The energy line was providing energy, scoring chances, and Carrier got a goal, I believe, that game. It was just a lot of fun, and that was the first time it felt like I was watching VGK hockey. Um, another point that McPhee made in the interview that I didn't even think about, but once he said it, I guess it kind of resonated. Uh, he said the Stone, Pacioretty, Stevenson line analytically was one of the top, I can't remember if he said the top, one of the top three lines or just one of the top forward combinations in the NHL from an analytics perspective. And that's, that's, that's interesting. Especially when you got people like Eichel and your boy Carlson and Marcheseau so and Riley Smith and, you know, we can go on and on about uh, who else is in that lineup. So when you have a line one that is one of the best lines from an analytical perspective, now you got Jack Eichel on line two. You got, you know, the Misfits, wherever you want to plug them in, plus the Donoff, plus uh, everyone else, uh, Ganmark. And then you got this energetic line four just out there thumping and creating chances this team, maybe I am buying a little more into the 513 compromises the team had throughout the season. And, you know, it's, I know we're pointing the arrow, arrow to DeBoer. You, you said that shooting is unpermissible, or not unpermissible, but, you know, look for a better shot, so to speak. But in the same breath, there's so many games, 50 attempts, 80 attempts, 93 attempts, whatever the record was that they set internally for a, VGK sometime in the last uh, third of the season. They do shoot, but you know the quality chances obviously didn't support all those shot attempts at times. But I'll go back to it. I think McPhee believes in everything that is coming from the bottom, starting with Foley, or sorry, excuse me, apologies, starting with uh, Pete DeBoer and 
what he utilizes on the ice, whatever that identity is, I think McPhee believes in it. I think McCrimmon is buying in because McPhee's going to tell him to. And I think this this uh, leadership crew gets one last hurrah to make a deep playoff run. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, one thing, again, that we're gaining through all the postseason interviews, this team really relies, and I think, on analytics. They really do. And then, uh, you know, when you hear what uh, what he was saying, uh, just that this team he felt was the best team that VG franchise has ever had. And that's kind of a lot of pressure. But it also leads me to believe, Chris, that perhaps they won't be making as many moves as I felt they might have earlier at, at the end of the conclusion of the season. Moves will have to be made. There are still, I think, in if the, if every player counted towards the cap, I think we're in the ninety million range right now. So we're six, seven, eight million, ten million, wherever that number is, we're over. And whether they can simply not resign a couple players or ship a couple other assets out to lessen, but McPhee said this as well. It's not just you can't just park a salary somewhere. Someone has to be willing to take it. So some of our targets, so to speak, we can start with the biggest lightning rod we have in Robin Leonard. No one, at least I don't think so, I don't think anyone is going to, let's start for free. Let's start for the price of free. You take Robin Leonard, give us a throwaway player that we're going to cut. Same thing with that happened with Marc-Andre Fleury. And then maybe someone will flip Leonard for a third-round pick later in the season. But I don't see that happening. Another, your, your favorite, again, William Carlson. I don't see, maybe someone takes a gamble on him, but I don't think it's going to be at full value. Um, to down off, let's just assume for a second we want to try and do something with him. I don't think his output lives up to his salary. Uh, Brassois, maybe. Maybe someone will take a stab at a backup goaltender so we can get Logan Thompson in the lineup. And, and there's others we can go with here. But if they're going to make a move like that to shape up the roster, I think it'll take another valuable asset. And honestly, I'm let's put it out there. Let's put it out there in the hockey universe. I am going to make a my first ever bold prediction, and that's Logan Thompson is not going to be a Golden Knight on the opening day roster or a Silver Knight. He is going to be, in my opinion, inside of another organization to make way for uh, some salary help. Wow, that a very bold prediction. And coming up next, VGK gives up the 16th pick in this year's uh, draft lottery to the Buff Sabres, and that as a result of the Jack Eichel deal. Coming up more after this on Locked On Golden Knights. Summer is coming, and with summer, you're going to need some food on the bars are the perfect snack to take with you on all of your family vacations. Chris has many, many planned, I'm sure. Uh, throw them in, the, in your bags and or in your kids' backpacks, wherever you can find some room. Make sure that everyone has a bar so they are fueled for your summer adventures. Part about Built Bars, they're healthy, they're delicious. No more sacrificing delicious food for health. With Built Bar, you can have both, and it's so easy. All you have to do is go to built.com and of course they've got all of the built bars and puffs, percent real chocolate. That means with built bar you can eat healthy, but it also tastes really, really good. And those built puffs that are so we're going crazy for the puffs. Not cuckoo for cocoa, just crazy for built bars. They're in crazy flavors as well. My favorite banana and my man Chris likes the churro. And, of course, they're only 140 calories. Sign us all up. And if that's not enough flavor for you, you might want to try the Mixed Box. Mixed Box comes with 12 flavors of bars, and it also pops as well. And once again, just go to Built.com. It's the best place to go. And you can find all of your favorites at Built.com. And you can pie, raspberry, double chocolate, many, many more. All are delicious, and all the flavors are coming out. Uh, a lot more flavors coming out, I should say, all the time. Check them out at built.com. Go to built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You will get 15% off your order. Use the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. 
Welcome back on Locked On Golden Knights and for making us the first list of the day. For your second list, and make sure that you check out, out Locked On NHL, the first round matchups to the each uh, each and every Stanley Cup kiss. Locked On NHL covers the playoffs like no other. And uh, again, check that out. It is Locked On NHL, the latest games from all of the local experts every Monday through Friday, free and available wherever. Ever you get your podcast, and let's talk about the NHL draft lottery. Uh, those uh, balls came up, the ping pong balls, although they don't show them on TV. But VGK gets the number 16 pick, which of course they ship off to the Buffalo Sabres, and that comes from the Jack Eichel deal. And Montreal wins the draft lot for the first time since 1990. Yeah, it's always an interesting experience. Um, why they don't show that process, I, I don't necessarily know, but that's uh, that someone else can make that decision. Um, we'll see what happens. You really don't have that immediate top tier talent out there uh, this year, so maybe it's a blessing not getting there. Maybe next year someone else will be there, but hopefully VGK isn't picking too high next year. But I'll say it again. I wish VGK could have finished on top just to watch the hockey world absolutely explode and Buffalo to wonder what it takes to catch a break. Last night in the playoffs, some really good action. I stayed up late to uh, sort of late, uh, not as late as it was <laughs> in Atlanta when I tried to watch you last weekend, but Adrian Kempe uh, with the big goal, the game winner in overtime and the LA Kings surprisingly now now have a three to two series advantage over the Edmonton Oilers. Everything about the playoffs is amazing. It's unpredictable. You know, I filled out my bracket. And I felt I was taking a shot, putting like the Rangers to make a deep run, not taking a shot at them. I just felt that, you know, if, if I'm going to go out on a limb, that's uh, a, a good place to be. Uh, the Blues beat in the wild. They take a three to two lead right now. Uh, I kind of had a feeling that, that, the Wild are, are a great team, but just the Wild don't make it out of the first round of the playoffs. That's just kind of how that goes. Uh, looking at that Kings-Oilers series, you know, Mike Smith, Mike Smith, Mike Smith. Mike Smith is not a, a goalie that is going to take you to the playoffs or take, take you through a deep playoff run. Is he a serviceable goalie that will help you during the regular season? Fine. Is he going to steal a game for you? I don't think he's that type of goalie. And there was a lot of other things wrong with that game last night on the Oilers' side. But, man, I cannot imagine that feeling that they have right now in Edmonton. And another individual I was talking with last night, is there a possibility that if the Oilers cannot do it with the combination of McDavid and Dreisaitl, do one of those two get moved? And are, could the Oilers be known as the organization that not just traded Wayne Gretzky, but also traded Connor McDavid? Can you imagine if that happens? It would be crazy. Yeah, and uh, that Oilers team, I think, has so much potential and firepower. We saw how they battled back in the game last night, down two mm -hmm. goals, forced it into OT. And then they were just playing on their heels for the entire duration, very quick duration of the extra period. Uh, the Kings have been surprising because they're a much better road team than at home. So now this series will shift back to Los Angeles, and we'll see if the Kings can close it out. Uh, also in the uh, NHL news today, the Calder Trophy candidates were announced, Chris. Maurice Sider of the Detroit Red Wings, Trevor Zegras of the Anaheim Ducks with all of his looks and such, and Michael Bunting <laughs> of the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's a two-horse race between Sider and and for Zegers. I really like Zegers, but we see him all the time here on the West Coast, and we don't have an opportunity to see an explosive and terrific player better with the Detroit Red Wings. Agreed. I don't have much on, uh, on Cider, but Zegers, um, I, I was at the skills competition, and he just, he stole the show. He absolutely stole the show there, and I think that was kind of his national and international, if you will, coming out party. Um, it's going to make uh, going to keep the Ducks valid and relevant for a long time as uh, as his talent grows. And I, I think uh, I think Zegras just 
runs away with the, the Calder, but who knows? But a lot of fun to watch, and I'm glad uh, we're going to see Anaheim a lot, and uh, me and Chris will enjoy uh, seeing Zgress when he comes to town. Yeah, he's awfully uh, exciting and fun to watch. And uh, for Cider, he tied uh, Kale McCall's uh, rookie record with 50 points uh, this season. And so we'll keep an eye on that and all those season awards. And nothing new on the Peter DeBoer watch, is there? I, he's still on something ice to me. And the best trade that could happen in the offseason, <laughs> trots for DeBoer. That's your trade right there, Chris. <laughs> Uh, I had to go there. Who knows? Uh, who thanks, knows? Who thanks knows? again. Uh, th thanks again to our good friend Gil Martin, locked on Islanders for joining us in today's mint. Uh, coming up tomorrow, we'll have a lot more news. Who knows what happens? We'll keep track of the playoff action that happens tonight. And don't forget to check out Locked On NHL, all the way from the first round matchups through the Stanley Cup. And here in Las Vegas, I call it the Stanley Cap because what the salary cap they're not going to win family <laughs> cup thanks my man chris gallick of course with us at td chris g on twitter and we thank you all for tuning in wherever it be uh be it on youtube subscribe like us enjoy our video content that we provide and again with our special guest today gil martin and uh, also there you can hear audio feed wherever you get your podcast i'm tony chris Asco for Chris Gollick. So long for now. We'll see you once again tomorrow right here on Locked On Golden Knights. Take care. <laughs>